And so before we continue to submerge and study the depths of our inheritance, the unchanging epigraph of our study of the Word of God is Luke 24, 44. Then Jesus said to his disciples, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets, and the Psalms concerning me. And for us as partakers of the body of Christ to share with Christ the fulfillment of all that is written about him in Scripture, we shall continue our study of our collaboration with the Holy Spirit and what is necessary to be done from our side so that we can receive the right to the power to put off our former way of life so we can put on the new form of life. The book of Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. That you put off concerning your former conduct the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which is created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. To fulfill this command, we, as we know, need to utilize three charging and fundamental verbs. And these are to put off, be renewed, and put on. We've noted that your decision regarding these three destiny-affecting actions, to put off, be renewed, and put on, will determine whether you transform yourself into a vessel of mercy or a vessel of wrath, or more specifically, will the occurrence of our salvation happen that is given to us in the format of a guarantee, or will we lose it and our names be forever blotted out of the book of life? In a specific format, we have already looked at the first two questions and have been studying the following question. What conditions do we need to fulfill so that by the means of an already renewed mind, we begin the process of clothing ourselves into the power of our new person that is created in accordance to God in Christ Jesus, in righteousness and holy truth? And when we speak of clothing ourselves into the power of our new person that contains the power of the resurrection of Christ in the all armor of light, we've concluded that we need God's help in the form of his redeeming mercy. The means of receiving any kind of help in the form of the inheritance of the mercies of God is weaponry of prayer or worship in spirit and in truth. Since prayer isn't just a man's means of communicating with God, but also a kind of legal and sacral right that a man gives heaven, a tool that activates the given law of God, man gives heaven this right so that heaven may intervene upon the territory of earth. Considering that the most powerful form of prayer is continual prayer, that does not back away from its goal until what is asked for is received, we together have been studying the format of continual prayer in the breastplate of judgment of the high priest, being a continual remembrance or memorial before God. The power of such a prayer is called to demonstrate the unlimited authority of God over our genesis in the allotted by him for us time and boundaries. Due to this, we came to the necessity to study the goal God pursues in his intentions when he urges and calls his children to become warriors in prayer. And also, in what way and upon what conditions God is able and desires to give man the right to become a warrior in prayer, so that man can present the interests of God in the implementation of his inheritance in God. According to the revelations of Scripture, our prayer as warriors in prayer are identified in the virtue of twelve precious stones of the breastplate of judgment, and they need to be, first of all, continual, second, persistent, third, diligent, with boldness, with reverence, with faith of your heart, with thanksgiving, with joy, in the fear of the Lord, and in the Holy Spirit. In the previous services, we in a specific format have already looked at the essence of the first eight components that identify the state of the heart of a warrior in prayer, as well as the quality of his prayer, and stop to study the ninth component, quality of continual prayer. This is the presence of the fear of the Lord in your prayer or prayer that is done or made in the fear of the Lord. But first, I would like to once again present the antonyms or opposite qualities of prayer that have already been a part of our studies. Because understanding the context or background of each quality, we will better understand the quality and character of true prayer. The antonym of continual is unfaithful or not continuing. The antonym of persistent is resisting.
The antonym of diligence is laziness. The antonym of boldness is audacity. The antonym of reverence is forsaking and hatred. The antonym of the faith of God is unbelief or resisting the faith of God. The antonym of thanksgiving is being unthankful heart or hard-hearted. The antonym of joy is sorrow and brokenness that dries the bones. And the antonym of the fear of the Lord is the fear of man. As in the previous qualities of prayer, it is necessary for us to look at four classical questions. First, from what wellspring does the fear of the Lord flow? And what qualities or criteria does the fear of the Lord have? Second, what purpose is the fear of the Lord supposed to fulfill within our relationship with God, with each other, and with all of the world? What price or what conditions do we need to fulfill so we can be filled with the fear of the Lord in prayer? And fourth, by what results do we need to examine ourselves on the presence of the fear of the Lord within our heart? In the previous services, we in a specific format already studied the essence of the first two questions and stopped to study the third question. I, in short formulations, I shall remind us of the essence of the fear of the Lord, which is contrary to the fear of man. And then we will continue further this very surprising material. We have noted that the fear of the Lord and the fear of man are two absolutely different programs that come from two diametrically opposite wellsprings, identifying the program of eternal life that comes from God, containing the quality and the nature of God, and the program of eternal death coming from the entrails of the fallen cherubim, containing his quality and his nature. The first Adam, due to his disobedience to God, was transformed into the programmable system of the fallen angel and inherited from him a program opposite of God's fear, which was passed down to all mankind and came to be called the fear of man. The character included in the fear of the Lord, as with the previous qualities, is prescribed in Scripture for creating prayer as a commandment, a requirement, a direct order, as a military command. If it's not fulfilled, the verdict is death or a final break of your peaceful relationship with God. The fear of the Lord is a program identifying the life of God, is identified as the spring of the wisdom of God, and is a keeper and demonstrator of this wisdom. And as a program, it is able to exist and demonstrate itself in nothing else but a programmable system, identifying the wisdom of the heart, which is the heart of a born-from-God man, that becomes a possessor of a faithful mind abiding in the commandments of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, a good understanding of all those who do his commandments, his praise endures forever, Psalm 110.10. We've noted that the reason for many misconceptions and wrongs is what our mind is dependent on or from. If we place our mind in dependence of man, we will be pleasing because of our weakness, their ignorance, and their religious ambitions. If we place our mind in dependence of the traditions of man, then for the sake of those traditions, we will remove or move the commandment of God aside. If we place our mind in dependence of logical form of thinking or obtained experience, then we also will be far from the fear of the Lord. Although the fear of the Lord as the wisdom of God isn't against logical or rational form of thinking because of its eternal being and existence and exalted nature in the fourth dimension, it does not depend on logic or a logical form of thought and governs logic. Therefore, only when we, contrary to many human authorities, place our mind in dependence from the revelation of Scripture, that is when we will be able to be filled with the fear of the Lord demonstrated in His divine and exceeding wisdom. We know well that the world we live in has many forms of existing fear and even more phobias, and practically the entire world is underpinned by fear and phobias. But all of these forms of fear come from one wellspring, the fallen cherubim. These fears were inherited from the first Adam when he sinned and were passed on genetically to all mankind. And further, all of these forms of fear do not parallel or identify with the unique and great nature of fear that comes from God and is passed down by right of birth from God to man. We need to keep in mind that there is a healthy form of fear that exists. It is the form of healthy thinking that does not yield suffering.
Any form of fear that does not come from God yields suffering. At the same time, the fear of the Lord prompts a trembling reverence before God and an unexplainable admiration and delight as it places man in the safest place called God. As it is written, there is no fear in love. That means in the love of God agape, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. 1 John 4, 18. Therefore, if our worship is done out of the boundaries of the fear of the Lord, which contains the 12 precious stones of the breastplate of judgment that we've been studying, then it cannot be accepted by God. And that is specifically why any attempt to enter the presence of God, to call upon God, or to serve God without the presence of the fear of the Lord, deeply offends God, does not consider God, and actually resists God. The absence of the fear of the Lord within the heart of a man testifies about the fact that this person is bound by the fear of man or human fear. And it's very sorrowful that these people are marching in the parade they are first marching into hell. Revelations 21.8, but the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. The word fear, wisdom, and commandment, when it comes to the nature of God, are identical as they identify the moral virtues of God. And because they are identical, the one word describes the other word as they come one from the other and authenticate one the other. This is specifically why the fear of the Lord is the true wisdom of God presented in the commandments of the Lord. At the same time, true wisdom in the commandments of the Lord is identified as the fear of the Lord, identifying the given law of God. And now the third question, what conditions do we need to fulfill so we can be filled with the fear of the Lord in prayer and abide within the fear of the Lord? In a specific format, we've already studied the five conditions that are necessary in order to abide and be filled with the fear of the Lord and have been studying the sixth condition. I will remind us that the boundary of the fear of the Lord as a program of God is the boundary of the heart of a person that fears God, as the heart is a programmable system for the fear of the Lord. The first condition for receiving the seed of the fear of the Lord into your heart is the necessity to clothe yourself into the mantle of a student of, of Christ, raising or elevating a person to the status of a servant of the Lord. Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Psalm 34, 11. The second condition for receiving the seed of the fear of the Lord into your heart is having a pure heart cleansed from dead works. For if blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Hebrews 9:13:14. Upon the condition, however, that a person doesn't hear the preached word about the truth about the blood of Christ, he himself will not be able to comprehend this without a teacher. The third condition for receiving the seed of the fear of the Lord into your heart consists in honoring the word of God and treating the word of God presented in the name of God and the given law of God as God honors and treats his own word. I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth, for you have magnified your word above all your name. Psalm 138, 2. This place of scripture talks about the fact that God has become a servant of his own word. Willingly, he has subjected himself to his own word that he has magnified in the temple of the human body because his temple is us. The fourth condition for receiving, abiding, and being filled with the fear of the Lord in your heart is the necessity to be a rod from the stem of Jesse and a branch that grows out of its roots. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of its roots. The spring of the Lord, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom 
and understanding, the spirit of counsel, and might, the spirit of knowledge, and of the fear of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. Isaiah 11, 1 through 3. Fifth condition for receiving the seed of the fear of the Lord into your heart. It is the requirement to be an organic member of Zion. Isaiah 33, 5, 6. The Lord is exalted, for he dwells on high. He has filled Zion with justice and righteousness. Wisdom and knowledge will be the stability of his times. And the strength of salvation, the fear of the Lord, is his treasure. And the sixth condition for receiving the seed of the fear of the Lord into your heart is the necessity to humble yourself in accordance to the demands of the will of God that are written in the commandments of the Holy Scriptures. Proverbs 22, 4. By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. To determine the condition for abiding in the fear of the Lord, it is necessary to examine yourself on the presence of humility, which provides God a foundation or grounds to lead us into the inheritance of the treasure of His fear. As much as we know humility, the quality that the fear of the Lord follows is the willingness and ability to fulfill the will of God. And this nature of humility is defined by the state of brokenness of our spirit and trembling before the word of God that comes out of God's mouth. And if the circumcision of the foreskin was a seal of righteousness upon the body of a man, then a broken spirit in circumcision of the heart is the seal of righteousness in the spirit of a man. Therefore, a person that does not possess a broken spirit in the form of a circumcised heart will never be able to produce the fruit of humility in obeying the will of God. In result, no one can possess the treasure of the fear of the Lord, abide within the fear of the Lord, or be filled with the fear of the Lord. This nature of humility comes from gentleness that is learned only from Christ. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Matthew 11, 29 and 30. In other words, humility, demonstrated in the brokenness of our spirit, being the circumcision of our heart, serving as the seal of righteousness in our spirit before God, is the result of gentleness demonstrated in a conscious and voluntary discipline of our mouth. It is this nature of humility that is the condition for us abiding and being filled with the fear of the Lord. And for us to possess such a nature of humility that is ready and able to confront the desires of the flesh, flesh and thoughts, being supported by organized powers of darkness. For the sake of fulfilling the will of God, it is necessary to study and get to know the will of God every day upon the conditions of Scripture and within the order implemented in Scripture. Otherwise, how can we demonstrate our humility in obeying something that we cannot clearly identify? Therefore, humility is, first of all, an active resistance against your corrupt desires, which are being supported by organized powers of darkness, attempting to avert or turn us away from fulfilling the will of God. And secondly, humility is the act of an active application of pressure upon the organized powers of darkness for the purpose of thrusting them out from, the, from within the boundaries that are under their control, but according to the promise of God, belong to us and are supposed to become our inheritance inheritance and the inheritance of our children Ephesians 5:17 through 21 therefore do not be unwise but understand what the will of the Lord is and do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation but be filled with the spirit speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord, Ephesians 5, 17 through 21. We've noted that to be filled with the Holy Spirit means to be obedient to the revelations of the Holy Spirit or be led and guided by the revelations of the Holy Spirit. As the Holy Spirit explains the essence of the elementary principles of Christ, contained in symbols, in proverbs, in allegories, and prophecies of the Holy Scriptures. Submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord means exclusively within the boundaries of the hierarchical subordination outlined within the boundaries of the commandments of the Lord. Therefore, humility, the condition of abiding in the fear of the Lord, is the ability to rule within the boundaries of your responsibility. First, to rule over yourself within the fear of the Lord, 
presented in the commandments of the Lord. The purpose is to subject the aspect of your emotions so that they fulfill the will of God. We will keep in mind that there is a significant difference between when God humbles us and when we humble ourselves. As an example of active humility fulfilling the will of God, we turn to part uh, to the part of one of God's inspired places of Scripture, where humility is shown confronting the organized powers of darkness and applying pressure upon powers that hate the will of God. Psalm 144.1.2 Blessed be the Lord my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle, my loving kindness and my fortress, my high tower and my deliverer, my shield and the one in whom I take refuge, who subdues my people under me. We've noted that God can only teach a student who inclines his ear to listen to the word of God who is in the likeness of the learned. An inclined ear that is prepared to listen to the word of God is that good and great nature of humility. This humility is the condition for obtaining the fear of the Lord and is ultimate beauty before the eyes of God. Listen, O daughter, consider and incline your ear. Forget your own people also and your father's house. So the king will greatly desire your beauty because he is your Lord. Worship him. Psalm 45, 10, 11. <clears throat> if a person worships and does not incline his ear to listen to the word of God, then his worship will not be accepted by God. If the ear of the heart of a man is not inclined to listen to the word of God, then God will not have the grounds to awaken his ear so that man can hear God within his heart in the likeness of the learned. Even inclining your ear, preparing yourself, doesn't mean that we'll be able to hear. For this reason, you need to have your ear awakened, and God awakens only an inclined ear. The Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned. This is prof Prophet Isaiah speaks of Christ. And so Christ, through Prophet Isaiah, describes himself, his behavior towards the Word of God to the words of his father how he listens to the words of his father or how he can hear the Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary and how does this happen he awakens me morning by morning he awakens my ear to hear as the learned Isaiah 54 the Lord has opened my ear and I have not backed away because by listening, God opens your ear and a person can become afraid even to death. He'll say, I can't do this. It's impossible to. Because when the will of God in fullness was presented before the Son of God, he became afraid and suffered. And he pleaded with the Father, Father, if if it be possible, if you're willing, may this cup be taken from me, but it is not my will, but your will. According to this place of scripture, we conclude that to awaken the ear indicates a status linked to the resurrection that was preceded by the act of humbling yourself to the death and the death of the cross. And this state of humility can only be possessed by a man with a broken spirit because the brokenness of the spirit is not just a mark of righteousness before God, which is the circumcision of the heart, but also a mark of the covenant, upon the grounds of which God is able to awaken the ear of a man so that this man can listen the word, to the words that come out of the mouth of God. There are two responsibilities. And if we don't fulfill our responsibility in this covenant, then God does not have an obligation to fulfill his part of the covenant. The brokenness of a man's spirit as a testimony of humility indicates the poverty of our spirit, where a person consciously and willingly refuses all protection and all reliance upon something or someone for the benefit of relying upon God. Job 36, 15 through 17. God delivers the poor in their affliction and opens their ear in oppression. Indeed, 
He would have brought you out of dire distress into a broad place where there is no restraint, and what is set on your table would be full of richness, but you are filled with the judgment due the wicked, judgment and justice take hold of you. The judgment of the wicked consists in them being convinced that they can and are required to inspect and control all words spoken by God's delegated person with their personal mind and also judge the word and behavior of all people that they come in contact with. At the same time, the judgment of the righteous consists in them giving an opinion only of words and behavior of the people for which they carry responsibility for before God. This also includes themselves within the boundaries and upon the basis of the revelations contained in the Holy Scriptures. When they respond or when they judge, they judge according to Scripture. The revelation that is given to them in accordance to scripture and judge only that which is within their responsibility and that's first themselves. The wicked judge all except for themselves. Therefore, when we, being righteous men, begin to judge as the wicked in the same place of restraint, God shows us the status of our heart that is not in accordance to the demands of humility. So the wrongful position or status we have before God, he'll show us that our heart is not in accordance to to the demands of humility, providing God grounds to open our ear to lead us from the state of death into a broad place of resurrection where the fear of the Lord dwells. If this man does not possess humility in his spirit, demonstrated in the readiness and ability to be as the learned, then God fulfills the verdict of eternal death over this person. My son, give attention to my words, incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. Proverbs 4, 20-22. When it speaks of health to all the flesh obtained because of humility, demonstrated in inclining the ear to listen to the word of God. This means making the resurrection of Christ ruler in our body by the means of which our body is liberated from the law of sin and death. It's not talking about simple healing here. When it says the health to all your flesh, that means the resurrection of life. My son, pay attention to my wisdom. Lend your ear to my understanding, that you may preserve discretion, and your lips may keep knowledge. Proverbs 5, 1, 2. A pure mouth that keeps the knowledge of wisdom that comes from above is the concluding and triumphant moment of the final reign of the resurrection of Christ demonstrated the th- demonstrating the throne of God and the Lamb within our body. And so our pure mouth will be the throne of God and the Lamb when Christ will reign within our mortal body and when the process of decay will need to abandon our body at the door of hope, at the door of rapture. It is this nature of humility before the will of God that David had as well as Jesus being the root and the offspring of David. Considering considering all of this, we will be studying the subject of active humility in the time when David obtained authority over his nation, where we see a symbol of our own obtained authority and power over our personal fleshly essence or our governing of our genesis, so that we demonstrating active humility would present our body as a tool of righteousness, so that we with success would step upon all the powers of the enemy in the form of poverty, illness, and untimely death, which we inherited in our genesis from the sinful life of our fathers. When David says, the Lord subdues my people under me, he is revealing the collaborative relationship of his humility with the abilities of God that are contained in the name of God. According to the given principle, we need to study the following series of questions. First, by what criteria do we identify the name of God that David collaborated with and obtained authority over his nation from which he himself came? Second, what purpose is there in obtaining authority over our nation in our relationship with 
of God from which we ourselves come. What price is necessary to be paid to collaborate with the abilities of God so that we can govern our genesis? And fourth, by what results do we judge that God has truly subdued our nation under us from which we ourselves come? To identify the criteria included in the name of God demonstrated in his abilities to subdue our nation under us from which we ourselves come, we need to answer first this question, what criteria is the name of God identified by demonstrated, demonstrating his rule over his nation that comes from him? The name of God by which he rules or governs his nation that comes from him within the boundaries of his holy temple, which is the holy body of every person who is a member of the body of Christ, is the word that comes out of his mouth, which he has magnified above all his names and made primary over all of his names. Again, I will read this place. I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth, for you have magnified your word above all your name. Psalm 138, 2. Building our body into the holy temple of God is the result of the fact that God in our body has magnified his word above all his names. And this means that God willingly subjects himself to his word which comes out of his mouth or that he has placed himself in dependence from his word in the temple of our body. This concept is well presented in the prophecy of prophet Habakkuk. I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. Then the Lord answered me and said, it's talking about the tower that is present in the heart of a person from which you can sense and differentiate good and evil and hear the voice of God. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets, that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak, it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Habakkuk 2, 1 through 3. According to this and other places of Scripture, we conclude that God is vigilant and has vowed to fulfill only that word of His that will clearly be written upon the tablets of our heart and confessed with our mouth as the faith of our heart, where we proclaim the not existent as existent or the unreal as real. Therefore, for God to rule over His essence is to be vigilant over His word in the holy temple of the human body so that the word be fulfilled in the time he appointed according to the given revelation so that God would subdue the nations under us from which we ourselves come we just like God need to be vigilant over what comes out of our mouth therefore the symbol of governing your nation from which you yourself come is governing over the earth from which we come since practically to rule over the nation from which we ourselves come and to rule over the earth from which we come is one and the same. In other words, we are called by God to rule over our Genesis exclusively upon his conditions. Genesis 3.19 In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground from out of which you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. We are taken from the earth, and our Genesis is from the earth, our beginning is from the earth, and we need to receive power to control the earth. Only then can we have power over our bodies. The result of God bringing us to power over our earth, which we need to see as power over our body, the result will be a sign that our earth in the form of our body will begin to give us its strength and will bless us. The first tilling of the ground before man sinned against God did not bring about suffering in the work. Tilling the ground until the time of the sinful fall of man did not only exhaust man, but the opposite, by tilling the ground he received strength from hers, energy, inspiration, and satisfaction. When God intended to create man from the earth, it was then he predetermined that man will rule over the earth, that God will pass on to him, 
so he can rule upon his conditions, just like God rules in heaven. God is not tired when he rules in heaven. A man also should not be tired when he rules upon the earth. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over all the earth. Genesis 1.26 Passing of the authority over your earth from God to man was implemented upon the same conditions and in accordance to the same order that God rules with in the heavens. With one significant point that not looking at the fact that God will give the earth to man so that he can rule over it, the earth itself was and continues to remain the direct possession of God and his great mystery that the angels want to know about. The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, 1 Corinthians 10.26. <clears throat> and this phrase is continually repeated throughout Scripture, especially <clears throat> when God began to began to uh, demonstrate His plagues over Egypt. And every time he would say, so that he knows that the earth is the Lord's, so that he knows that the earth is the Lord's, every plague was supposed to uh, help the Pharaoh understand that the earth was not his possession, but the earth is the Lord's possession. And so Israel had the command, has had a commandment from the Lord, Leviticus 25, 23. The land shall not be sold permanently, for the land is mine, for you are strangers and sojourners with me. The, and so the land was only able to be sold for 50 years. When the 50th year would come, then the previous owner would be able to take it back. It's very interesting that if a person sold the land, but there was a year that remained before the year of the Jubilee, then he would only sell it for one year. After a year, it would return back to its owner. And we know that this kind of thing also exists uh, like, for example, Hawaii, the island. Uh, all of the land that is obtained, it is obtained for a certain amount of time, and when the time is up, then it will return or give, be given back to the Hawaiian inhabitants, the people that are originally from there, from that place. And so you purchase, say, for 99 years, and after 99 years, if your uh, land or your whatever it may cost, but the time will come that your children or your grandchildren will need to let it go and it will freely be returned uh, to the possession of that nation that was originally there. It's just an example. These and other places of Scripture tell us that the rule of man over the earth was decided with specific conditions, where the earth could either bless man or the opposite, curse man, in dependence of man's relationship with God. Then, Adam said, then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake, in toil you shall eat of it, it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles, it shall bring for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. Genesis 3, 17, 18. Considering that the symbol of the earth is our body created by God from the earth, we conclude that if in our communication with God, sin will be eliminated, then our body will not produce thorns and thistles, but the opposite will be a blessing for us. However much a person... Uh, cares for their body, there's some kind of illnesses or other problems that he has, and a person needs to periodically uh, either needs to go to a massage therapist or whatever it may be, a chiropractor, and to other people and other doctors that do you not know of the, this of old since man was placed on earth that the triumphing of the wicked is short and the joy of the hypocrite is but for a moment the heavens will reveal his iniquity and the earth will rise up against him the increase of his house will depart and his goods will flow away in the days of his wrath this is the portion from God for a wicked man the heritage appointed to him by God Job 24 through 20 Nine. 
And so sin and jealousy shorten your life. Uh, returning to the word of David, God subdues the nation under me. This indicates the responsibility for our calling, which is our cross. And so carrying our cross is fulfilling your calling. We've noted that these two phrases, to fulfill our calling and carry our cross, are tightly linked since the one phrase explains the other phrase. Because to carry your cross while following Jesus is to fulfill your calling as Christ fulfilled his own calling carrying his cross. Therefore my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father, John 10, 17, 18. And we have the commandment in carrying our cross to lose our life to re, re, uh, deny our nation, the house of our Father, and our personal life to then receive it again in a new form. Therefore, our humility consists in us according to the, to the conditions of God and in accordance to His order collaborating with God so that He subdue under us our calling in the form of our nation, which indicates the obedience of our feelings. In Hebrew, to subject or subdue is to make obedient, to overcome, to take, to obtain, to rule, to govern, to stomp on, or to trample. The thing is that in Scripture, the verb subdue is used as it relates to its genesis. That means that our genesis begins to bless us. When the verb subdue is used to, in regards to our enemies, then it means that we will stomp and trample upon them. <clears throat> to stomp and trample upon the habits and the sin within our body so that Christ would be able to reign within our body. Answering the second question, what purpose is there in obtaining authority over your nation from which we ourselves come in our relationship with God? As much as we've established a criteria of governing over your genesis is the mutual obligation of God and man that each side is called to fulfill, where each side needs to be vigilant of their words and fulfill them timely. Answering the third question, what conditions do we need to fulfill to be clothed into humility before the will of God and pay the necessary price for the treasure of the fear of the Lord, we came to the conclusion that first humility demonstrated in vigilance over the words of faith of the heart which we confess to receive the right to possess the treasure of the fear of the Lord consists in honoring all of the commandments of God given to us so that we acquire the earth of our body. Therefore you shall keep every commandment which I command you today that you may be strong and go in and possess the land which you cross over to possess. Deuteronomy 11.8 God intends for us to take the authority and the power of the throne of God and the Lamb uh, into our body and then our mouth will speak pure words <clears throat> and our words will be in power or as powerful as the words of God that come out of His mouth. We've noted that the acquisition of the earth of our body lies on the other side of the Jordan. When you will cross over, is written, you go into the land to possess it, to take it. It's at the, the other side of the Jordan. So we need to cross over so that by the power of the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, obtained in the resurrection of Christ, we being on the other side of the Jordan can begin liberating our body from the law of sin and death and doing so acquire the earth of our body. Jordan is a symbol of the death of Jesus Christ. To enter into the Jordan and walk the bottom of the Jordan is by the cross of the Lord Jesus submerge into the death of Christ where we die for our nation, for the house of our Father, and for our fleshly life. Coming out on the other side of the Jordan where the promised land lies is the start of the process where we are called to clothe our body into the resurrection of Christ that is into our new person created in accordance to God in Christ Jesus. Keeping the commandments is to keep yourself undefiled by the world, which is our nation, the house of our Father, and our previous corrupt desires in inclinations and preferences. The starting point of our humility before God is the measure of time for preparing provisions or food, which is the 
span of three days for the crossing to the other side of the Jordan to adopt and redeem our body. Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, Pass through the camp and command the people, saying, Prepare provisions for yourselves, for within three days you will cross over this Jordan to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess. Joshua 1, 10, 11. <clears throat> We know that the symbol of the mysterious three days and three nights is the allotted time, allotted time in which we are called to study and get to know the price of our redemption that is paid by God by the death of His Son, Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean a physical or literal three days and three nights, but this is a limited amount of time. It's a symbol of a limited amount of time. The provisions or food that we are called to prepare within the span of three days so that we can cross the Jordan and inherit the promised land is the form of land in the form of our body is the allotted time we are given for obtaining the oil into the vessel of our hearts the next identifying sign of humility before the will of God for the right to rule over our nation or to govern our body by the power of the resurrection of Christ is receiving and keeping the two spies within your heart now Joshua the son of Nun sent out two men for Acacia Grove to spy secretly saying go view the land especially Jericho so they went and came to the house of harlot named Rahab and lodged there. Joshua 2.1 The harlot Rahab and her household living within the walls of Jericho is a symbol of the body of Christ as well as a symbol of our body being an organic member of the body of Christ. The two spies who lodged and slept in the house of Rahab is a symbol of the truth of the word of God and a symbol of the Holy Spirit. The next identifying sign of our humility before the will of God for the right to rule over our nation or to govern our body by the power of the resurrection of Christ is to take Take 12 stones from the bottom of the Jordan and replace them with 12 other stones taken from the land on the other side of the Jordan. The 12 stones taken from the bottom of the Jordan is a symbol of the 12 pearly gates with the 12 names of the sons of Jacob, providing the right to the power to inherit the promised land in the form of adopting and redeeming our body. This is where Christ, by the uh, by death, he conquered death. The twelve stones taken from the place of rest in the land of Canaan, put at the bottom of the Jordan in place of the others, is a symbol of our body, where the law of the spirit of life abides in the form of the tree of life, bearing fruit twelve times a year, bearing its fruit each month. <clears throat> the next identifying sign of our humility before the will of God for the right to rule over our nation or to govern our body by the power of the resurrection of Christ is to mark the new person with a seal of righteousness, a righteousness he had before circumcision. People born in the wilderness is a symbol of the new person created in accordance to God and Christ Jesus in righteousness and holy truth. The circumcision of the new person is an act of humility where the brokenness of the new person is evident, testifying of the carrying of your cross and following Jesus. <clears throat> this is the circumcision of the ear. The next identifying sign of our humility before the will of God for the right to rule over our nation or to govern our body by the power of the resurrection of Christ is to honor the Pesach of the Lord, which will allow us to eat the produce of our land. The difference between performing the Pesach in Egypt and upon the flats of Jericho in the land of Canaan consists in Pesach that was performed in Egypt behind closed doors with the blood of the Lamb upon it, gave them the right to the power to come out from the bondage or slavery of Egypt. At the same time, Pesach that was performed in the land of Canaan gave them the, po- gave them the right to the power to conquer the land of Canaan. To eat of the produce of the land is to live by faith or to be nourished by the confessions of the faith of the heart. The next identifying sign of our humility before the will of God for the right to rule over our nation or to govern our body by the power of the resurrection of Christ is to begin the process of conquering the promised land for the purpose of making the resurrection of Christ reign within our body. The Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand, its king and the mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city. All you men of war, you shall go all around the city once. This you shall do six days. And Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. It shall come to pass 
when they make a long blast with the ram's horns, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all of the people shall shout with a great shout, then the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up every man straight before him. Joshua 6, 2-5. We know that Jericho is a city of palm trees. This means a city of righteousness because the righteous shall flourish as a palm tree. But in the given situation, the righteousness founded upon the works of the law that the scriptures identify as dead works, which is why they were supposed to be destroyed. This righteousness purified the heart from dead works the conscience from the dead works. Conquering Jericho is a symbol of purifying your heart from dead works to serve the living and true God. The next identifying sign of our humility before the will of God for the right to rule over our nation or to govern our body by the power of the resurrection of Christ consists in taking of I. And it came to pass when Israel had made an end of slaying all of the inhabitants of I in the field in the wilderness where they pursued them, and when they all had fallen by the edge of the sword until they were consumed, that all the Israelites returned to I and struck it with the edge of the sword. So it was that all who fell that day, both men and women, were twelve thousand, all the people of I. For Joshua did not draw back his hand with which he stretched out his spear until he had utterly destroyed all the inhabitants inhabitants of Ai. Only the livestock and the spoil of the city Israel took as booty for themselves, according to the words of the Lord, which he had commanded Joshua. So Joshua burned Ai and made it a heap forever, a desolation this day. And the king of Ai, he, he hung on a tree until evening. And as soon as the sun went down, Joshua commanded that they should take his corpse down from the tree, cast it at the entrance of the gate of the city, and raise over it a great heap of stones that remains to this day. A small little city, uh, uh, only 12,000 people. How is it that there would only be 12,000 people, men, women, children, everybody, all together, only 12,000 people? And why not more than uh, 12, not, not one more, not one less? How God... Uh, uh, how it was that at, when at the time of conquering, that's exactly how many were there, and they were destroyed. The Holy Spirit allowed the whole uh, Joshua that the entire nation go. The entire nation. They said, "Why do we need to send the whole uh, nation? There's, there's not a lot of them. Just a few of us can go." But he says the entire nation needs to go, and they conquered it in a very interesting way. God had a strategy in taking this city. He said, you will go, and when you fight, make the make it look like you're running away from them, that you're giving up, and when they see that you're, th- that, that you're as if giving up, they will follow after you. But you uh, put hide men behind the hill, and when they f- uh, run uh, far away from their little city, uh, let those that are behind the hills go in and burn the city, and that's what they did. And so those who lived in I uh, ran, are running away, and they followed them. And so there's there was a reason for this, because one person, at the time of taking Jericho, took something that was holy, that was the Lord, that wasn't supposed to be taken, was forbidden. It was supposed to be committed to the Lord or given to the Lord. And he took a, a, a golden a, a golden piece and a garments, and Israel experienced a destruction for that reason. And so in this city, they were running and... It is written that not a single warrior remained in that city. All came out and ran. And when they ran, uh, then those who were hiding entered the city when all of these ran out of it. Uh, And when Joshua saw the smoke coming, he raised his his arm uh, and and his weapon, and that was a sign to the people to turn back around and, and attack. And that then they look behind them, they see the city is burning, and uh, and the Israelites are coming after them behind them, and those in front of them also 
uh, came after them and they destroyed all 12,000. The word I is a heap of broken parts or pieces or ruins. Conquering this city with the small inhabitants and all 12,000 people had an important strategic purpose in the relationship between God and his nation, which was called to become the foundation for victory of the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus within our body and the form of the principles of Christ. <clears throat> so here they were able so that the principles of Christ and the law of the spirit of life was to become victorious specifically here not in Jericho where they cleanse their conscience but here where they uh, according to this given law because Satan al always presents upon the promised land false doctrines a false Jericho false righteousness 12,000 and so everything as if this uh, great everything's the same here and there preaching the same that's what he that's what he says but not everything is the same the order is completely different everything's completely different Satan takes hold of something he takes of a a, a, a specific uh, words of scripture truth and perverts it mm. And so this, this city was as if a symbol of the counterfeit of the principles of Christ, the 12 principles. However strange this may seem, for our spirit, the symbol of the king of I, who was hung on the tree, is a symbol of the, dead of, uh, the death of the Lord Jesus for our redemption from sin and death. Because all of the other kings died differently. They were killed, uh, either beheaded or... But this king was hung on a tree. And he, until the setting of the sun, that's a symbol of Christ. Whoever is hangs on a tree is a symbol of Christ. And in the law, it's written, you will not leave a person hung uh, it, through the night. You will uh, take him down before the night, night uh, comes. And so Christ died for our sins. And with death, he <clears throat> overcame death. And that's why the city is called a heap of broken parts or pieces and as well as ruins redemption contained in the law of the spirit of life is identified in the 12 principles of Jesus Christ that came in the flesh the livestock and the spoils that the sons of Israel were supposed to share amongst each other is a symbol of the gifts of the Holy Spirit the next identifying sign of our humility before the will of God for the right to rule over our nation or to govern our body by the power of the, of the resurrection of Christ consists in proclaiming blessing upon Mount Gerizim and curses upon Mount Ebal only after they had taken over I after that were they able to finally fulfill the commandment that Moses had given now Joshua built an altar to the Lord God of Israel in Mount Ebal as Moses the servant of the Lord had commanded the children of Israel as it is written in the book of the laws of Moses an altar of whole stones over which no man has uh, wielded an iron tool and they offered on it burnt offerings to the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings and there in the presence of children of Israel of the children of Israel he wrote on the stones a copy of the law of Moses which he had he had written then all Israel with their elders officers and judges stood on each either side of the ark before the priests and the Levites who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord the strange Stranger, as well as he who was born among them, half of them were in front of Mount Gerizim, and half of them were in front of Mount Ebal, as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded before that they should bless the people of Israel. And afterwards, he, read, he reads all of the words of the law, the blessings and the cursings, according to all that is written in the book of the law. There was not a word of all that Moses had commanded with Joshua, did not read before all the assembly of Israel. Joshua 8:30 through 35. And so the sons of Israel, the 12 tribes, were willing to fulfill the commands of Moses to confirm the given law of God that is contained in the curses and blessings upon this, these two mountains, confirm them within their body, within their essence, and for us as well. Now it shall be, when the Lord your God has brought you into the land which you go to possess, that you shall put the blessings on Mount Gerizim and the curse on Mount Ebal, Deuteronomy 11.29. The symbol of the confirmation in our body of the given law of God consists in blessings and curses, consisting in blessing and curses, 
is the testimony of the fact that the carriers of the resurrection of Christ within their body, for those who bless them will be a blessing, and for those who curse them will be a curse. Numbers 24, 9. Blessed is he who blesses you, and cursed is he who curses you. And so why would you need this confirmation, you may ask? Why do you need it that in your body this law uh, reign and be confirmed? The principles, the teaching of, of curses and blessings. Because a person in whose body the resurrection of Christ will reign will become he will be this element of blessing and cursing. Those who will bless them will be blessed. Those who will curse them will be cursed. This is written in many places of Scripture. Here's one of them. Isaiah 65, 9 through 17. I will bring forth descendants from Jacob and from Judah an heir of my mountains. My elect shall inherit it and my servant shall dwell there. Sharon shall be a fold of flocks in the valley of Accor, a place for herds to lie down for my people who have sought me. But you are those who forsake the Lord, who forgot my holy mountain, who prepare a table for Gad, and who furnish a drink offering for many. And so these are gods, Gad and many. Therefore I will number you for the sword, and you shall all bow down to the slaughter, because when I called you did not answer, when I spoke you did not hear, but did evil before my eyes, and chose that in which I do not delight. Therefore thus says the Lord God, Behold, my servant shall eat, but you shall be hungry. Behold, my servant shall drink, but you shall be thirsty. Behold, my servant shall rejoice, but you shall be ashamed. Behold, my servant shall sing for sing for joy in their heart, but you shall cry for sorrow of heart and wail for grief of spirit. All of this is going to happen here in this wor- on earth. This is not going to happen in heaven that th- we will be eating there, here they will cry. <clears throat> At this time, God will show the difference between those who honor him and those who don't. And those who said that they honor God, they will suddenly see that if you would have honored God, this would have happened. You shall leave your name as a curse to my chosen. For the Lord God will slay you and call his servants by another name. How, how shall he slay them? Because... Uh, they will leave their name as a curse to my chosen, so the chosen curse them, and call his servants by another name, so that he who blesses himself in the earth shall bless himself in the God of truth, and he who swears in the earth shall swear by the God of truth, because the former troubles are forgotten and because they are hidden from my eyes. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. Isaiah 65, 9 through 7. And so the new heaven and the new earth is the body of a person. A new spirit and new body. We have a new spirit, our new heaven, but we don't have the new earth yet. By faith we have it, we've received it, and we have become begun to proclaim it. We have become to begun to conquer it. Every one of you need to think about where you are. Are you behind the Jordan or at the other side of the Jordan? Have you conquered Jer- Jericho and have righteousness by faith and not by the law and isn't doing something to receive justification but performs righteousness? He went further, he performed Pesach, he took I, and where are you? I think you each one will see where you are. Let's turn to the next second component of humility that is demonstrated in the vigilance over the words that we confess, the faith of our heart, so that we have the right to possess the treasure of the fear of the Lord, It consists in zeal uh, and not fretting because of the prosperity of another. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Psalm 37, 7. And so according to this place of scripture, to bear fruits of humility, obedience, and hope to God, in we need to not fret because of him who prospers in his way. 
And so wickedness is a perversion where a person perverts the law of God in such a way that it's almost different, difficult to identify that it is perverted. And in this way defiles himself and wounds the hearts of those that are under his responsibility. When a person is wicked, he... he wounds the hearts of those that are under his responsibility because he as if speaks correctly but somewhat perverts uh, changes the truth because he wants to become successful in an easy way he doesn't want to pay the proper price he wants to have success he wants to have power he wants to have fame God said to Abraham I will make you known imagine if Abraham would have tried to make himself known or fame by the form of wickedness did not follow the law accurately began to pervert the law because the law Abraham knew this law and his uh, surroundings knew this law, his children and his servants, and he needed to fulfill the law before servants accurately. If he began to pervert it or change it somehow uh, and pretty much uh, ascribe things to himself that weren't for him, and so of course this is this uh, of course is in regards to all people and especially those who have responsibility over others and this first of all is for pastors that sometimes very very publicly very uh, uh, change the truth because if they don't change it then it, they will be struck by other people uh, because they'll say why are you preaching against uh, yourself because you are like this wicked so he either will be to change to not be wicked but if he <clears throat> is uh, then he needs to change the truth so people would not judge, be able to judge him according to the truth that he would have preached in Hebrew, uh, <clears throat> uh, where it says do not fret, this, this meaning of this <clears throat> do not fret, um, that a person that's next to you and he's successful, and he's successful because he does wicked works, and he has, this means do not be irritated, do not be angry, do not... Uh, be upset do not <clears throat> don't uh, lead yourself to perishing or destruction because of it or su to such frustration and so don't be frustrated when this person obtains something in an unlawful manner and he uh, already uh, announces that he has reached the goal and you have that same goal but you see that he unlawfully uh, came to the success he has and you began to become irritated and angry. You began to become upset and you can destroy yourself by doing that. So don't do these things. And so you need to be humble and the, and the humility that we'll have will allow us not to fret uh, because of him who prospers in his way, in his wickedness. And so, by, because by fretting about this person, we will then be transforming into his image and will be doing th start doing things in his likeness as well. And so here we're talking about not God uh, disciplining us, but we discipline ourselves by making the decision to. Here's what Apostle Paul writes, Romans 16, 19, For your obedience has become known to all. Therefore, I am glad on your behalf, but I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. Here we're looking at uh, becoming obedient to God and rely upon God and not worry about one who is successful in his evil or because of his evil. According to this place of scripture, to be obedient in humility, this will happen we need to be, when we're simple concerning evil and wise in things that are good.
In other words, the fruit of humility is the result of wisdom, and it's necessary to perform, for performing good, and the result of simplicity is necessary for the correct reaction to evil. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, therefore... Be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Matthew 10, 16. Wolves are not people of this world, but those that are attempting to take the position of God's delegated persons by perverting the truth and perverting the elementary principles of Christ. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the discipline, the disciples after themselves. Acts 20, 29 through 30. Considering that good is the will of God, that's the good, uh, acceptable and perfect will. And having wisdom or having the armor of wisdom to perform good is by the means of the program of the order of God to have in your heart knowledge of the will of God and the ability to perform God's will. And so evil is carried by those who are wolves. One that is pure will not have this. And when we're talking about one who is perfect or one who is pure, not wicked, is we're talking about as pure, uh, pure stone or pure wine. And so if a person is not the programmable system of God to be a carrier and demonstrator of his wisdom and his simplicity, then this person will be far from knowing and bearing the fruits of humility to God. And this person will therefore not have any right to abide within the fear of the Lord. And the opposite, if a person will be wise as a snake, and simple as a dove. A child has the wisdom of a snake and the simplicity of a dove. <clears throat> when it's talking about a snake in the original, it's not every snake, but uh, the abilities, uh, a type of a snake that has the abilities. Uh, she, when a sorcerer is trying to uh, take control of this snake, she uh, covers one of her ears with her tail and presses the other ear to the ground. He thinks when uh, he has been successful, he tries to take this serpent or the snake, uh, and the snake bites him. And so to be this wise, you need to be deaf to any rumors that are passed around, especially rumors uh, when they be, when bad information be passed down, passed around uh, about your your spiritual father, your pastors. Why did the people leave the church? Because they opened their ears and started listening. They started listening and people started telling them different things and they weren't bold enough to come to me and find out if it's true. They just believed it. Why? Because they opened their ear. And so a child, as we talked about, however you may say, how many bad things you may say about his parents, he will not understand it because his ear is closed. It's a symbol. He will not understand what you're saying. This is wisdom. And the simplicity uh, is when a person is pure, he is simple. He doesn't have the bitterness in his heart. When he is not angry, he's not guilty, he's simple, that means he doesn't have a wellspring of evil. He doesn't have that uh, wave or that uh, channel that would be able to turn on uh, bitterness or anger ha or hatred. And so a person may cry because he hurts, but he's as a child, but he's not, he doesn't have this anger and bitterness in his heart. And so be wise as a snake and simple as a dove. Uh, we need this wisdom to not be jealous of people who are becoming successful religiously, but in unfaithful ways. Do not become an angry and upset, but Rejoice in what you have. You see that people are marching into hell, entire uh, groups thinking they're going to heaven. Don't be upset. 
uh, rejoice that you have from the Lord and follow what you have. And if you hear some kind of negativity about each other, close your ears to not hear these words. As one sister told me leaving the church, uh, I know that this is not true 100%, but our mother is poisoning us, and this poison is working. I know it's a lie, but I'm leaving because I'm poisoned. And so let us now bend our knees and our heads, and may the Lord bless us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word that we were able to receive today. According to your great mercy and your goodness, you continue to reveal to us new and new angles of your great given law, which is contained in your fear that is called your fear to make us rich uh, so we may have the treasure of your fear that would be able to keep us from the powers of hell that would keep us and protect us from our destructive desires that would give us victory over our corrupt desires and would help us reject, deny our nation, the house of our Father, and our personal life so that we can receive it again in a new form and a new way. May your goodness and mercy be magnified within the hearts of your people that have inclined their ear to hear and fulfill what they hear. May they be blessed before your face amongst all the sorrow and suffering and the storms, satanic storms, that today are so strong. But we thank you, Father, that in the storm we still hear your vo- only your voice and that our ears are focused only upon your voice and we're deaf to all other words and all other interpretations of the truth of other people. We may your greatness be blessed for your sons and your daughters. We with joy and hope in patience wait until you fulfill your promise and begin to reign within our body when our body will be delivered by the law of the spirit of life from the law of sin and death when you at the door of hope will give to us our our vineyards and our valley when you will make this dry wilderness fruitful when we will sing and be glad and when our enemies will shout aloud because of the pain in their heart and they will kiss then the dust of the feet of your people you said this word and you will fulfill that word because you have magnified your word in the temple of our body which has become the temple of the Holy Spirit you created it for yourself this is your personal place this is your holy place which is why the devil is trying to take control of the body but you sent your son Jesus Christ as sin and paid a sacrifice for sin and died for our sins and resurrected for our justification we glorify you and we thank you we worship and rejoice before your face may your nation be prepared for this glorious hope may you give to us the testimony before we meet you upon the clouds as you gave it in his time to Enoch because he walked before your face we thank you that you have given us the opportunity to bear that fruit that Enoch had bore and brought it in the form of Methuselah. We thank you that we have driven away death, not looking at the fact that it still continues to reveal itself. You have taught us to consider ourselves dead to sin and living for you. You have taught us to call the not existent as existent. And so we today can say, that we have driven away death, we have driven away decay, and we thank you for the victory we have over death and hell in our bodies. 
may you be glorified in your greatness because finally at the end of your uh, of the age you have reached your goal in the work of your redemption because when you gave your son Jesus Christ you perfectly knew that you can fulfill this within your person and that you can bring your person to victory you can redeem not just his spirit and soul but his body also we worship before your great and glorious name our great God Son and Holy Spirit Amen our Father in heaven hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and do not lead us into temptation but deliver us from the evil one for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen and now let us proclaim our unchanging manifestation now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God our Savior who alone is wise be glory and majesty dominion and power both now and forever Amen